Today, we have three speakers. Three speakers, two co-editors of the book, uh, Philip Droner from PICTE Asset Management, Cecilia Tortajada from the Institute of Water Policy, and our old friend, Peter Ng, from CE of PUV. They will be giving their a short presentation, five, six to 10 minutes each, and uh, then we'll have a Q&A. And we hope to finish by six, Tommy, I understand you have to go, so we'll finish by 6.30. Please, Cecilia, Peter, uh, Philip, if you could come to the stage. Philip, since you are the intellectual godfather of the book, uh, I think we should start with you, please. <laughs> The idea behind using the Copenhagen Institute of Future Studies, where we were picked as a member, is that they're social and behavioral scientists. And uh, at the end of the day, we deal with human beings. And sometimes I find that we do, and having been a former engineer myself, that we always forget the human side of things. And it's particularly relevant, I believe, to water. Water has its very, very complex value chains, very complex feedback loops, and always addressing it from an engineering or a technical point of view, sometimes we perhaps miss the, the key point, which is the person or the people behind it. Some things about the Copenhagen. They, are, they call themselves futurists, but they're not about predicting the future in the sense we would like to do it from a deterministic point of view. It's a framework that allows us to look into the future. It doesn't mean that will be the future, but it does help us ask perhaps the really important questions is how is society evolving? How are people evolving their behaviors? The role of culture, which are a set of values, uh, and the sort of politics also gets involved in that, and how that, human, that behavior can change over time. I think it's relevant for water in a very simplistic way because we are always talking about the fact that there's a scarcity of water and the idea is always to supply more water. Nothing wrong with that, uh, but the behavioral aspect of it is to reduce demand, make it more efficient. And particularly ac accepting that point would be also a point which is very challenging how to do that, particularly in an area of water where the economic or the financial incentive of reducing demand uh, is non-existent, practically speaking, as opposed to other commodities. So that was the thinking about behind it. Some of the learning points we got, uh, we'll just re summarize a few, is that we have to understand, one of the things we realize is the difference between the ability to pay and the willingness to pay. And that applies to many things. In some areas, it's very obvious between the two. And let me put it more succinct in terms of water. There's a willingness to pay for water, which is about a thousand or somehow a factor of a thousand more. It's called bottled water. Why do we, are we willing to pay for that? But we're not willing to pay when there's a tariff increase, which is marginally less than that. And if you look at it from a liter or a cubic meter perspective, uh, that is non-existent or there's a big debate about it. It's understanding why or trying to answer the question, why is that? I'll rest it with that last comment and um, Thank you very much for the opportunity to come here. Thank you. Let's talk a little bit about megatrends. Some of the megatrends that are reshaping the world, some of which are discussed in the book we are presenting today, include urbanization and demographic and social change, climate change, resource scarcity, technological breakthroughs, and as the world is witnessing at present, also shifting global economic and political powers. Now, the importance of global shift or megatrends relies on the economic, social, and environmental impacts they have on institutions and on society as a whole, both at present and in the future. The question is, as uh, Philip says, we should be asking questions all the time, looking for a, an answer. How can we better prepare for them? How can we make the best of them? Or should we, as a society, should we just accept them and be able to adapt or not and live with them? So changes are being fast and unexpected, as in the case of climate change, but also global policy making, or I should say, decisions that are taken purely for political reasons. Now, so many changes require that policymakers get prepared. 
because the decisions they have will have an, the decisions they take will have an impact in institutions and in society that will be as big as those of the megatrends. So more questions, more questions that we should be asking. Are policies, institutions, regulations, management, even human resources, are we prepared for so many changes? Would institutions be able to function efficiently? In terms of basic services such as water supply, sanitation, how would these megatrends affect service delivery? What would be the impacts on infrastructure of sea level rising? Or to hydropower, irrigation, water supply with the changing precipitation patterns? And this, how would they affect societies in practical terms? What policies should be developed? How should they be implemented? We know about Singapore. We have learned on its exceptional preparedness. But this is not a coincidence. Nothing is a coincidence in Singapore. It is a result of long-term planning and long-term awareness of the many possible impacts of change. So it is being prepared for change. This, however, seldom happens anywhere. Singapore is the exception of the rule rather than the rule. One more example of megatrends is technology, an area in which the world is developing certain fixation, choosing to oversee it from an overall point of view. We are choosing to see the positive side. Now we know robotics are being used by businesses to increase productivity, and this has grown rapidly in recent years. There is nothing wrong with this except that it has an enormous social cost. But this, there is no sign that it will reduce in any time, any time soon. So technologies present important regulatory questions. This is the reason why I mentioned this example. But many times these questions are not addressed in a timely manner. So far, in terms of innovation, this is in the field of technology, but not so much in, the terms of, in terms of policies. These megatrends are adding to existing challenges such as economic growth or slow economic growth. Another example, with more questions, looking for more, more answers. By the end of 2017, India is expected to have a further 30 to 40 percent reduction of jobs in the manufacturing sector compared to last year. Considering that manufacturing employs 12 percent of population at the national level, this means that by the end of this year, some 62 million people will have lost their jobs. So the creation of 10 million jobs per annum that was promised by the leadership seems to be very far from, achievable, from being achievable. So finally, for a world that is living in times of rapid change, policies, institutions, regulations, and these, these innovations we talk about, but innovations in terms of policies, they require more comprehensive frameworks and more innovations, but innovations that will be based on long-term planning and on more effective implementation. And this is something on which the whole world has to learn from Singapore. Thank you. Peter, if somebody had told me that someone who ran the police and the security force for 20 years can run PUB so well, I, as an academic, I might have been a little skeptical. I have changed my mind. Uh, he has done a remarkable job as a CEO of PUB. Uh, in fact, one of the strengths of PUB has been I had the pleasure of working with three CEs. Three have, all the three have been outstanding by the global standard. I'm saying this, I'm a scientist, as most of you know, I speak my own mind. I, I don't follow the party line. So I can tell you, Peter, you are one of the best CE I've ever met anywhere running a water agency, and perhaps we should hire you to go and sort out some of the problems of Delhi or Mumbai. Peter has a wonderful chapter on, uh, in our book on Singapore, how Singapore did it, and Singapore's water future. So Peter, please take your time so that our guests today learn things you have done so well. And one little thing, in 1965 when Singapore became independent, I was teaching at that time at the University of Strathclyde in, in Glasgow. And I, I remember a few of us talking about Singapore since uh, professor lectures at that time, we were young, Singapore's independence, and most of my colleagues said, Singapore's future is bleak, uh, all of them. And I was the only one who said, well, it's a small country, small population. If it follows the right policy, it will do good. 
it has done remarkably well. In fact, so much so that in 1965, if somebody told me that uh, Singapore water within 15 to 20 years will be one of the best in the world, probably at that time my answer would be stop smoking hashish. <laughs> but Peter, all yours. Our central water challenge in Singapore is scarcity. Although Singapore sits right on the equator and is in the tropics, we are short of water. In fact, Singapore is one of the most water-stressed countries in the world. This is because we just don't have the space to be able to collect and to store all of the water that we need. And we certainly don't have the mountains and the rivers and the huge forest watersheds that supply every other major city in the world. And if you think about it, no large city is ever self-sufficient in water. Every conurbation is compelled to bring water from outside in order to quench the thirst of its citizens. The Romans built impressive viaducts to feed their cities. New York City is famous for the, for the quality, the pristine quality of its drinking water because its city fathers um, bought and protected 5,000 square kilometers of forest watershed in upstate New York. Like New York, like New York City, Tokyo too depends on a huge forest catchment way outside of city limits. And our twin, our twin in, in Asia, Hong Kong, is dependent on mainland China for its water, getting most of it from the Pearl River. And we in Singapore are about halfway through a 99-year water agreement that gives us the right to import 250 million gallons of water a day for neighboring Malaysia. You may, not, you may not know this, but this imported water is enough to satisfy half of our current demand. Despite this dependence, we are, comfort, we are confident that Singapore can be fully self-sufficient when the water agreement with Malaysia ends in 2061. By that time, Singapore will certainly have more people, more commerce, more industry, and a vastly greater demand for water. So our challenge is not just to replace the water that is currently being imported, but also to find the additional water to meet the greater demand in the future. Fifty and some years ago, the water situation in newly independent Singapore was a constant source of worry. Back then, there was too much water and too little water all at the same time. Pancake flat and with very poor drainage, it was inevitable that Singapore would be flooded when the monsoons come around. And I'm sure many in this room will remember the regular floods that we had experienced while we were growing up. And yet at the same time, clean drinking water was in short supply. Our rivers were severely polluted because of unregulated discharge from farms, squatters, and industry. And then the lack of water storage didn't help things. At Independence, Singapore had only three reservoirs, McRitchie, Pierce, and Salita. And together, these three reservoirs just did not have the capacity to tide us over a long, dry period. And this became painfully obvious to the people of Singapore in 1963 when water had to be rationed for 10 long months. So it is easy to understand why water security has always been seen as nothing less than an existential challenge for Singapore. And Singapore's leaders have since independence declared that our continued existence as an independence nation, independent nation is directly contingent on enduring water security. The late Lee Kuan Yew, Singapore's first Prime Minister, had famously remarked that water dominated every other policy, every other policy had to bend at its knees for water survival. So it is such clarity that goes on to explain Singapore's highly developed water strategy today. Let me briefly summarize what our water strategy is. Our water strategy comes in three parts. Firstly, we do everything that we can to maximize our own yield. We strive to collect every drop of rain that falls on our island and channel it into storage. This also means turning as much of our land area, small as it is, into a watershed. 
and then keeping our drains, our canals, and our waterways pristinely clean. Already, two-thirds of Singapore is now water catchment, so making us one of the very few places in the world to implement urban rainwater runoff and harvesting on a large scale. And to eliminate contamination, stormwater drainage is entirely independent of the sewage system in Singapore. Secondly, Singapore, perhaps more than any other place in the world, thinks of water as an endlessly recyclable resource. In our mind, the H2O molecule is never lost. We have long been convinced that water can always be reclaimed and retreated so that it can be drunk again. PUB, which is Singapore's National Water Agency, is a world leader in this. Today, PUB is able, literally, to turn wastewater into sweet water. We collect every drop of our sewage and then reclaim, reclaim it and turn much of it into drinking water again. Thirdly, and no less important, Singapore has adopted desalination in a big way. When reverse osmosis membrane technology made desalination economically viable, we adopted it with great zeal. PUB currently operates some of the largest and most modern desalination plants in the world. And we continue to make big investments in desalination research to find technology that will allow us to desalt for cheaper. Let me now briefly explain why portable reuse is a mega trend and why it plays such an important part in Singapore's water future. Wastewater reuse is particularly attractive to Singapore because it is, it is drought resistant. The requisite treatment technologies for portable reuse are now commonplace and their reliability and efficacy are well established and are actually improving by the day. And even better and unknown to most, making sewage portable actually requires liter for liter far less energy than desalination. So all this makes portable reuse of wastewater a veritable mega trend, one which we have embraced full-heartedly in Singapore. Our strategy of recycling water has led us to create a circular water economy in Singapore. Indeed, when it comes to water, it is simply unacceptable that it should be tossed out just after one use. Today, PUB manufactures new water, which is ultra-clean, high-quality recycled water on an industrial scale. And we now have sufficient new water capacity to meet 40% of our daily demand. The portable reuse of water may, have, may be an emerging megatrend, but reverse osmosis desalination of seawater has been a megatrend for some time now. Twelve years ago, Singapore opened its first desalination plant. Today, today about a quarter of our total demand for water can be met by desalination. In less than a year from now, that will go up to 30% as we open our latest desalination plant. And then in less than five years from now, desalination will be able to cater to close to 45% of our total water demand as we open even more desalination plants. The share of desalination within Singapore's water portfolio is significant in both its scale and the speed in which it was achieved. The ramping up of desalination capacity from nothing to more than 40% of the daily demand in less than 15 years, I think is breathtaking and is probably unprecedented. Singapore is so bullish on desalination because we fully believe that desalination can only get cheaper. Not because energy will become in inexpensive, but the certainty that technology will progressively and inevitably lower the energy required for removing salt from seawater. And PUB, we are placing big bets on this. And we are convinced that we can cut by half, at least by half, the energy that desalination requires in the, new, in the near future. In conclusion, let me just finish by saying that Singapore takes an uncommonly long view when it comes to water management. We plan decades ahead 
we keep a close eye on emerging trends and we are quick to adopt them when they make sense for Singapore. We do all this in order to ensure that Singapore's water system is adequate, is resilient and is sustainable all at the same time. Therefore, we have decided long before it was fashionable that portable reuse and seawater desalination, which are now mega trends, will play starring roles in Singapore's water future. I will end here. Thank you. Listening to Peter's statement, I will make one forecast to 2060, which is not in your official forecast. I'll say that by 2060, even though it says now the water demand will double, my forecast is it will not double. It will be less than double, probably 50% more. I hope so. And you will have more water than what you, do, what you could do with it. Maybe you can start exporting it to somewhere else. <laughs> uh, I'm quite convinced because uh, as, as I look at what's happening in the domestic scene in the world, as I look at what's happening in the industrial scene in the world, uh, there is a major changes going on, both domestic side and industrial side. I will, I'm convinced in the next 15 to 20 years, we'll see very significant reduction in water requirements. So I think uh, the estimates you are working to and the, what EDB has given for the industrial water demand, they're over-optimistic. Singapore will never need that. Actually, that's my view. As usual, I am 95% sure I'm right. So now is the question and answer session. If you have any question to any of these three, please feel free to ask questions. Hi, my name is Jessica. Um, I'm not really involved with water management, but I was thinking from hearing your speech talk about water production, and I was wondering about water consumption mega trends. Yeah. Um, any, I, I could turn my eyes to look at Miss Cecilia, but yeah. So on water on water consumption. So you know that we're going to increase our water consumption by a lot. And I was thinking about this because someone was saying that the production of coffee uses up so much water. And I was thinking, forget the production of coffee. When, when people drink coffee, it has a laxative effect. Can you imagine the number of flushes that it takes to get rid of all the coffee from our systems? So basically, our consumption is driving a huge demand for water. And I was wondering, um, does the book address water consumption trends? Because I know we're producing a lot, but we're going to use up a lot more too. This afternoon, there was a very interesting uh, seminar in IWP by Dr. Philippe Brunner. And he was making this distinction between the water use and the water consumption. So let's go to water consumption. What you say is true. Water is, is expected to increase. And it's very interesting because there is more technology. There is supposed to be more knowledge, more awareness, but it is not. So we are consuming more. And we are consuming more because we are more, per, we are more people in the planet, but also per capita. But for example, if you see in the United States, the country is using total amount of water, consuming total amount of water that years ago, like a decade ago. So not the whole world, not the entire world is that inefficient. But it is not only about drinking water, about flushing the toilet. It's about agriculture, it's about industry, it's about trying to be efficient in every sector. And no, no, the book doesn't deal with each one of them because that is not the role of the book. Our objective with the book is to assess certain megatrends. So this answer, you won't find an, a, an answer for this question. You will find for another one, but not for this. You will find an answer for these questions in a different type of book, which we have also published, so I can tell you about that. Actually, we're consuming less water on a per capita basis, at least for Singapore. Our aim is to continually lower the per capita consumption of water, we are now at slightly less than 150 litres a head. So the average person in Singapore uses up 150 litres of water a day a head. Uh, that's quite low, uh, not, not the lowest in the world. Uh, so we, we have some scope left to do. I think we can, and I'm, I'm sure Asit is with me on this, I think we can, we can approach 100, I think, uh, you know, 100 litres a, a day is, is doable without sacrificing you know, uh, our, our high standard of living. And the big consumer of water, of course, is industry. And, uh, but that, that one, we're even more hopeful because technology 
improving technology is going to make uh, industrial production more and more productive and more and more efficient as far as water is concerned. And uh, obviously, PUB has a, a big role in encouraging this and moving our industry to use water even more efficiently. So I'm, I'm actually, I'm quite hopeful on, on that. I think we have to get semantics perhaps for some, but there's a difference between, I like to emphasize that, between use and consumption from a water perspective. Um, let me put it this way. We use a lot of water. We don't necessarily consume a lot of water. Let me give you the example. The water, as long as it stays in a catchment area, it's just being used. It's there. It might not be the right quality, and then you need technology to bring it to the right quality. Water, when it gets consumed, it, I would argue, leaves the catchment area. Now, it leaves the catchment area in one area, agriculture, which is food value chain. That's where the water really gets consumed because you need the water to, obviously, to, plant, to grow the plant, but then it gets exported. Most, most countries are net importers of food. So it leaves the catchment area. And I think it's important to differentiate between the two aspects, between water use. You're right, absolutely. Industry does use water, consume water also. But the point is, it doesn't consume to the extent agriculture does. Yeah. And that's one point. And the second point is, yes, industry is a wide term. It's mainly for the cooling and heating that you consume water. Because it goes away in, in, in the process of heating and cooling towers yeah. and power generation. But it's mostly heating and cooling, which is mostly power generation. So I think I would be more specific in saying power generation, which is the big consumer of water. Um, for us, it's cooling. Oh. Right, cooling is, is the big consumable, and, and that's wasteful because the water gets evaporated, is you know it's lost <laughs> to the atmosphere. So um, we are on a big push now in PUB to encourage our industry to switch to seawater cooling. Of course, you have to rejig your processes, and it takes money. And we are willing to actually even co-fund some of this uh, some of this retrofit. But really, <coughs> if we can um, not use you know perfectly drinking water. For cooling, for cooling processes, I, I think it will help a lot. Last year, I got you to address the university's conference in Newcastle. And the issue is this. Singapore is about five, six million people. It's a city-state. The world is about a thousand Singapore's equivalent. And the issue was, if the university and the city evolve over time, and generates new ideas. Water is a very important feature for future research and development. And out of that conference, you were then called to the Apostolic Academy of Sciences in Rome. And the issue there was not water as a mega trend, but water as a human right. Could you comment on that? Because if your father of this book talks about culture, you have the church who is thinking of it as a human right. It is a more powerful pressure towards this issue. We are actually seeing a lot of effort towards water as a human right. Uh, if you look at it, Anthony, uh, most the world as a whole has accepted the fact water is a human right. But we have failed miserably to make it available to people right among right quantity of water and right quality, especially the quality. So that we have a lot of work to do before every human being gets the amount of water they need and the quality of water uh, that is needed. So the biggest problem I see in the future is not on the quantity for the most of the world, developing world as a whole, but how to manage the quality. That's going to be the biggest problem. Uh, but I have no doubt that uh, if the, our politicians wake up, we can solve the water problem easily. Uh, people talk about water scarcity. In fact, uh, this morning, Peter was saying, uh, according to the UN, water, Singapore is a very water scarce country. I think you said 148, of, uh, 148 out of one, or 170 out of 190 countries. In oh, terms we, of water we, scarcity. We are joint f uh, number one. No, no. <laughs> in, in terms of water scarcity. Yeah. Huh? We are no, joint number one with um, places like um, 
uh, the Palestine, yes. and, and Yemen. So, <laughs> places in according the to UN and the World Resources Institute, yeah. Singapore is a very water stressed country, very water scarce country. Yeah. Ask any Singaporean uh, if they feel any water stress. But it's, uh, the world has enough water. For example, let me give you one example. Uh, I've been advising the government of Qatar. Uh, Singapore uses 148 liters per capita per day. Would you know what an average Qatari, Qatari citizen, not the foreigner, average, what an average Qatari citizen uses per day? Would you make a guess? Any of you willing to make a guess? It is 1,200 liters per capita per day. Yours is 148. Qatar is supposed to be a desert country, 1,200 liters per capita per day. And that's not all. The Qatar National Water Agency loses 40% through leakages. Singapore is less than 5%. Okay, in order that an average Qatari gets 1,200 liters, the Qatar National Water Agency has to produce 1,700 liters per capita per day. So if you tell me countries like Qatar can survive with water, with that type of things, water is not a problem in the world. The problem is management. We, I can take any country of the world and show it to you. With good management, you could have plenty of water for times to come. And I'll also make a prediction for Singapore. I'll agree with uh, uh, Peter. By 2060, I won't be here by that time, but 2060, I can predict, I'd be very, very surprised if Singapore's water consumption is over 90 liters per capita per day. <laughs> I I'm just telling you right now, and I will also go ahead and just tell you that within the next 20 years, Singapore's water consumption will decline dramatically, both the domestic and industrial. Because what I see in industry now is many of the CEOs, they have become very water conscious because water has become an existential problem. Nestle Unilever is now putting a shadow price for water as a result of which they can use technology which otherwise would not have been possible. So if we put all this all together, I, th I think you'll, you'll find the projections are rather optimistic. It's good to be optimistic and you'll meet that and you'll have excess, excess capacity but I'm quite convinced that will be the case. Uh, it's a comment to what Dr. Theo, uh, the, to his question. The interest of the Vatican, which is the interest of the Pope, is precisely on, on people getting uh, water in quantity and in quality. And of course, the concern is on the poorest people. I remember we were mm. working in South Africa at the time when there was a price increase. That was not significant for most of the population. But at that time, I remember that the, the minister was discussing, this was in Stockholm during the World Water Week. He was saying that he was uh, working with the, at the time when the upper had uh, finished, all the black population moved to the city. So you had all of a sudden these very big informal settlements with no services. And so he was, he was talking with some of the people and, and he came across with one lady and she said, I can't pay. So you see, this run, you are charging I can't pay. And I cannot have clean water, and we are breastfeeding, and it was at the time of the, the highest time with HIV. So it has implications, and that is a concern of the, of the Catholic Church, that, and the Pope personally, that is, that water can be provided not free as it tends to be uh, discussed dogmatically, no, no, not free, but that is priced properly, but, uh, that people have access to it. So that is a concern, and in that sense, that is, we're hoping to make some type of contribution. Really? Yeah, since we're talking about the Vatican, I must share my experience with the Vatican. Um, I was once called to a meeting, not with the Pope directly, but one of his assistants, cardinals. And there was a discussion about uh, water, but as a unifying dimension, because all religions, now we talk about the spiritual side of water, I must say, it was, the, it was the incredible experience I had as a water fund manager to deal with the spiritual aspects of water and as a unifying aspect of, of water. But allow me to go a little bit away from that um, and look at the um, universal side of what we call the human right to, to water. I would emphasize the word access. I think it's a universal, it goes beyond culture, it goes beyond the societal behavior. The access to water is universal as a, as a concept. I don't think anybody would argue over there. The question obviously is, yes, I would like to free, have free food, health care, 
education, and the list security, and it goes on. The fact is we have to contribute to have those, to have those access, and water for me is not an exception in that sense. The UN actually passed a resolution. Yeah. I, I think yes. I'm, yes. Yeah, Ambassador Ko can confirm this. So it's not just the church talking about it. The, I mean, a resolution was passed in the UN to say that water is a human right, and, and, and I mean, that means that um, it must be accessible, um, it must be of the right quality, and it must be affordable. And I think in the resolution, it defines affordability as less than 1% of, of, of income. So, so no, don't, don't get the idea that water is free because it's a human right, it's free. No, it must be affordable. So uh, I run an com- uh, asset management company called Divina Glory Asset Management. And people ask me, does the Vatican invest in that? I say, no. <laughs> That's just a joke. Uh, the, the question is that, um, well, um, looking at the water mega trends, and I heard the allusion to the promise of new technology, if, if a PUB is going to bet on desalination as one of the major technology. Um, my question is, do you have any specific insights onto what types of technology would bring the cost of water down? And if it's not desalination, if it's kind of a re- reuse water concept, is there something in the reclamation of water, wastewater area, which um, you have come across? So this is addressed to, uh, to, uh, to um, uh, yeah. Uh, to, to you. And what, one final point would be uh, to uh, the uh, doctor, um, sorry, I'm very, Dr. Philip is, uh, is about, as a PICTE asset manager, do you try to capitalize on the mega trends for your investors? And, and, and how do you reconcile that with the human rights uh, element? For us, the mega trends are a framework to identify themes, investment themes. It allows us to be focused. And to do that, uh, we look for companies which have business models which are benefiting from the megatrends. So in that sense, we're addressing basic human needs. Uh, There is a technology side to it, uh, which goes across all our themes, whether it's security, whether it's water, whether it's health, uh, which has just three examples of our themes. Uh, But we're basically addressing basic human needs, and therefore the question about human rights, uh, I would say, again, it's, I'm reversing the question the other way around. If we're addressing human needs, are we not addressing the question of human rights in a positive way? Peter, do you want to say anything? Yeah, technology? okay, desalination, we're very bullish on it, and, and um, um, we, we, are, we are spending a lot of money on, on research in this area, um, and it's promising, and I'm, I'm quite confident um, that we will be able to drastically reduce the energy required to take salt out of seawater um, through various means. Uh, one very promising way, if you think about it, is how nature does it. Um, fish, you know, fish in the sea, they need fresh water too. So they are somehow able to, to get rid of the salt quite easily. Um, mangrove plants, right? They live in brackish water. They need fresh water too. They, they are able to get rid of the salt quite, quick, quite easily for very little energy. So that area of research is promising and we, we're doing a lot of work in that. Um, the other area is electrochemical deionization. I think that's promising too. And we, are, we, we are doing a lot of work in that too. And, and we are grateful to our, our two universities. We have um, Water labs in, in both our universities, and they're doing world-leading work. I think very recently, right, they were ranked number one and number two, number two in yeah. the world yeah. for water research. Yeah. So we have a lot of good, good stuff going on here, right here in Singapore. <coughs> so I'm bullish. So please give a hand to the panel. Thank you. May I request my good old friend, Ambassador Extraordinary, Tommy Ko. He's a remarkable diplomat. Remarkable father of water, godfather of water, Tommy. Thank you for coming. Professor Asit Biswa, one of the world's um, most respected authorities on water. Dr. Cecilia Totahada, um, his wife, his muse, his intellectual collaborator. 
Mr. Philip Brunner. The, I will call you the inspiration behind the book. I will not use the term Godfather. The term Godfather, at least in America, has criminal uh, uh, connotations. And, and Philip, I don't want to make you a subject of interest to the former police commissioner of Singapore. <laughs> Um, so I want to congratulate all three of you um, for editing this important book on megatrends in water. I also want to say to uh, Peter that you may know this, you may not know this, but I'm one of your unpaid employees. You may be wondering, what, what do I mean? Um, as you know, PUB organizes uh, once every two years a very successful Singapore International Water Week. And I've been chairing the Water Leaders Summit. Um, so let me just share with you um, three thoughts this afternoon. Um, it is true that the UN General Assembly has recognized the access to clean and affordable water as a human right. Uh, I would also say that um, in 2015, the UN adopted uh, a, a collection of goals called the Sustainable Development Goals. These goals have replaced the Millennium Development Goals, which expired in 2015. There are 17 goals. The number six goal is on water. And what Sustainable Development Goal number six says is that by 2030, every human being on earth should have sustainable and affordable access to clean drinking water. This is the goal. This is the goal that we all aspire to. Um, the second point I want to share with you is that in the year 2009, the New York-based uh, Asia Society um, a very important institution that, that acts as a bridge between Asian and, Euro and American leaders, uh, appointed me to chair a, a task force to look at water as a security issue. And uh, in, we, we produced a report that year, 2009, entitled Water Security in Asia. And in this report, we drew attention to the fact that there are some water-related challenges that could become security challenges, such as water dispute between neighboring countries, water conflicts resulting from agricultural and industrial pollution, uh, dispute between upper riparian states and lower riparian states, and the alarming increase in waterborne diseases due to inadequate was wastewater uh, treatment and facility. And I think that, <clears throat> that all of us should support research and development and harness the progress in science and technology towards this noble ambition contained in the UN Sustainable Development Goal number six, which is that we want all the people of this earth by 2030 to have assured and affordable access to safe and clean drinking water. Thank you.